read your book recently, How to Be a Conservative, and I think it's arguably a serious question, is conservatism s still alive at mm -hmm. all? Because we've seen in the United States, for instance, conservatism has been reduced to a type of uh, free market economy. It's really an economic conception and not really a moral uh, conception. So maybe we could just start. Yeah. Uh, well, this is one of the worries that uh, intellectual conservatives like me have. There aren't very many intellectual conservatives, it has to be said. Um, we, on the whole, take the view that ordinary people are conservative, uh, but they just don't articulate it. Sure. They're not ever pushed into the place where they've got to find the way of expressing their views rather than just having them and acting on them. But uh, when it comes to politics in a democracy, politicians have to offer things always. Right. Uh, and that means that there's a natural tendency for them to put their policies and their suggestions in economic terms. They say, you will be so much better off if you vote for us than if you don't. Um, and gradually the language of economics takes over every question so that it doesn't look as though there's any real distinction between politics and economics. And I think this is this has actually damaged the conservative position greatly because precisely what conservatives are trying to say is that there are things that are jeopardized, things that are at risk, uh, precisely because of our modern way of assigning a cost to everything, right. of seeing everything in economic terms, the profit and the loss dominating everything rather than those things that really matter to the spiritual and moral health of the community. So, um, but you're absolutely right that, that uh, because of this dominance of the economic question, conservatism tends to be seen as simply an apology for a free market economy, right. come what may, you know. And so if there's a question about an institution, for instance, what should we do to protect the institution of marriage or, or primary education or whatever? It gets put into, an, an, into another form, you know. What are the benefits economically right. of the old idea of marriage? You know, who can answer that question? Um, you know, one of the things that, that is troubling to me, Berkeley is probably one of the ed most educated cities on the planet, just mm. in terms of a sheer number of PhDs, people that have, have been through... Uh, high levels of uh, academic training, and a lot of our neighbors are, are PhDs. We have one of the highest concentrations of Nobel Prize winners. What's really interesting is this is also one of the most liberal mm. um, cultures in the world. And so the question, and I think a lot of people see this, is that conservatism and intellectualism are almost mutually exclusive. And, mm. and very often the, uh, the conservative view is a kind of, it's almost, we've got some troglodytes out there that, that tend to present conservatism in a way that smacks of an almost anti-intellectual approach. And that's very different from, say, a Burkean yeah. type of conservatism, which acknowledged gradualism and the importance of change. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I mean, you... I've, I've suffered this all my life, that, well, at least ever since I became a conservative, in, which was in May 1968 in, in Paris. Paris. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I didn't know, I hadn't a very clear idea of how to articulate it. All I knew was that when I looked down the street and saw all these um, rowdy students throwing stones at policemen, I, I just said to myself, whatever they believe, I, I believe the opposite. Right. And then I didn't know what it was. Uh, and, um, and then it was a sort of lifetime's work to find out what the opposite is. So, uh, and I somewhat arrogantly came to the conclusion uh, that it's, um, if you start thinking about politics uh, in an intellectual way, you are likely to be on the left. 
uh, because that provides a systematic solution, an answer to the questions, gives, puts it all in a system, and, and also gives you a rather dignified and self-congratulatory place in the system. But once you started thinking, if you think a bit harder and longer about it, you'll move back to what you would have been if you had never thought at all. You know, and right. that's, my, that's my view is what, is what an intellectual conservative is. He's, it's someone who articulates the real reasons for not having reasons. Say that again. Someone who articulates the real reasons for not having reasons, hmm. but just feeling and doing what's right. Right. Well, I think, you know, uh, uh, it's, I think it's Yeats. Yeats has a wonderful poem, uh, Easter 1916. Mm. And, and in there he has the come let us mock at the great that had such burdens on the mind and toiled so hard and late to leave some monument behind. He wrote that when he witnessed uh, some Irish um, revolutionaries destroy right. a beautiful uh, yeah. house of a very wealthy uh, landed English, uh, Anglo-Irish yeah. person. And in a lot of ways that poem articulates that idea that it's very easy to destroy uh, yes. and tear down. And, and, and one of the, I think one of the things that's so tempting for many people because the world is so troubling to so many people and, and so many people suffer in this world and, and a lot of what the, the liberal left tends to, to rely on is, is that sense of indignation that a lot of idealistic people feel because yeah. there are things that are deeply wrong with, with the world. But, but then when we look historically at, at, at how, when these people have gotten into power, whether they're, I mean, people t tend to forget that the, the, the Nazis were actually, they were quite bohemian in a mm. lot of ways. They, they had a lot of leftist politics. Certainly their economics was, was tend to be collectivist and, and, and they were national socialists as opposed to being internationalists. Yeah. But when they, when they get into power, they, they tend to really, really tear things down and don't <clears throat> give us yeah. a... Uh, well, uh, I, I think there's an explanation of this. Uh, it's um, what Hegel calls the labor of the negative. Right. Uh, that um, the, the initial instinct on the left is that negative instinct, you know, that things are wrong. Uh, and it must, they must be rectified. They can only be rectified, however, by the seizure of power. And so we're going to seize power in order to rectify them. But once you've got the power, the negative is still there in your heart mm. because it, it's driven you all along. You know, that's the thing which has inspired you. So you set about destroying things, uh, punishing people. You, you find classes who are to blame you know, the Jews, yeah. the bourgeoisie, whoever yeah. it might be, yeah. uh, uh, and you don't get out of that negative structure. Right. And I, I felt, that's what I felt very strongly in 1968, you know, that, okay, that of course there are things that are wrong in France, but there are also things that are beautiful and right, and you've got to go through this and come back and rescue those things, which is much more important than destroying a few obstacles along the way. Right. Um, Blake has an interesting, the, uh, he says, the hand of vengeance found the bed to which the purple tyrant yes. fled. The iron hand crushed the head and came a tyrant in its stead. And that tends to be a, 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 a pattern that we see again yes. and again. That when, if you have, for instance, in, in uh, Iran's a good example of that. I mean, Savak was, was one of the major reasons for the revolution itself because... Mm the heavy-handedness of the Shah, yeah. his, his secret police, which he probably had no idea. They very often live in these silos oh, and bubbles. Yeah. Um, but uh, they've got, you know, the secret police, the apparatus all comes back. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the course. disappearing, uh, the people that disappear all disappear again. Yeah. So, th I mean, this is part of the problem. But again, it's still this fundamental problem. For instance, I mean, one of the things that, that, that you talk about in uh, in fools frauds and firebrands is is the idea of power being the the way in which everything is articulated the the mm. critique is about power i mean foucault's a good example of yeah. that of somebody who just saw everything in terms of power but there's there's definitely truth embodied in that and i think that's why it's so seductive for so many people yeah. i mean we have to deal with with the fact that so many people are seduced by this because 
they experience, especially marginalized and disenfranchised people. Yes, that is true. Um, but of course, in the intellectual world, it's extremely corrupting to see things in this Foucauldian way. You know, you, instead of asking the question, is what uh, Hamza saying true? I ask the question, you know, what power is advancing behind that? You know, you then disappear from the picture, right. and also what you've said disappears from right. the picture. Yeah. I'm not no longer engaging with you, I to thou, at all, right. uh, uh, because th uh, without the concept of truth, there is no real engagement between people. All I am seeing is the power that's speaking through you, and that, um, of course, you can look at the whole of culture in that way, which is essentially what the postmodern curriculum is: right. taking one writer, one philosopher, one musician after another and just talking about you know like uh, Susan McClary on Beethoven that this is uh, fantasies of rape speaking through right. this music you right. know uh, uh, it's, it's extremely boring after a while because it's totally well, mechanical it's, it, it's a lens I mean I, one mm. of the things I say about critical theorists I, I you know that if it was a lens that it might be useful sometimes to just yeah. peer through that lens, but but it's a corneal transplant. <laughs> that's, you know, and, yeah, and, that's and a and good it metaphor, yeah. Yeah, it becomes the only way. Yes. And I've seen, one of the things that I've seen with students uh, in my own teaching experience is, you know, I've, I've had critical theorists in my classes, and whenever they raise their hand, I, I could almost verbatim tell them what they're going to say, yes. the response that they're going to give to whatever was said. Yes. And, and... Uh, well, then we need to understand uh, why it is so seductive. Uh, that's my point. I, yeah. It troubles me how seductive it's been. And it also, I grapple in my own self with the amount of, of, of genuine injustice in the world yeah. that, that, that takes place on a daily basis. And I mean, for instance, um, you know, their attacks on capitalism to me... Uh, the, the corporate world today is so powerful, and to use a favorite term in, in that in that world is hegemonic. Mm -hmm. You know this idea where monoculture uh, becomes becomes so I imperious, and uh, we we've seen so many. I mean, I'll give you an example. When when I was young, um, one of the treats in in my experience was to go to a bookstore. Bookstores have pretty much been wiped out in the United States because mm -hmm. of these corporations so small bookstores are not able to survive mm. so now you have you you had borders but then borders goes bankrupt mm. and and then now we've got we're left with barnes and noble mm. and 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 so if you go in who's picking those books who's actually choosing what books like if you go for instance to to the the teen section it's almost all about vampires and really weird occultic mm. stuff it's not like you know the Hardy Boys or or Nancy Drew sure. mysteries. It's it's very corrosive ideas. Yeah. And uh, we've slightly changed the topic now. We're not really talking about um, this postmodern obsession with power. Right. We are we're talking about um, well, change from, in the structure of life. Right. And but, but for me, a lot of I mean, I'll give you an example. Herbert Marcuse, who I, I'm not a fan of by mm. by any stretch. But when when I read some of his works. I was struck by real insights about things that were very troubling about American yeah. culture. Uh, One-dimensional man, yeah. this idea of a consumer and, and life as consumption yes. and, and, and losing me. I mean, his solutions is a whole other problem. But, and this is something I think that's very seductive is that, that the critical aspect of, of, of Marxism and neo-Marxism has always been, it's always had a, a resonance in a lot of people. There's something very, very powerful about it. When you, when you get to solutions and how we deal with these things, mm. we're in another realm. But if, 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 I think if conservatives don't really address the, the, the real serious critiques yeah. uh, that are there yeah. about the status quo. Yeah. I think you're right. They have, they have, uh, perhaps neglected those critiques, but um, you know, as I was saying earlier, the purely negative approach to the status quo is simply going to perpetuate this negativity and has done. Uh, you, if you're not, 
The typical conservative, in my reading of events, is someone who looks around himself and he finds things that he loves. You know, and he thinks, well, those things are threatened, they're vulnerable, right. I've got to protect right. them. Um, and it's not often that you find on the left somebody who looks around and finds things that he loves. It's, um, it's always something that's gone wrong, something that is even hateful, uh, and you've got to mobilize against it. If you've lost any sense that actually the world is lovable, and that there are things therefore to be rescued in it, you have actually lost the, the sense of why there is such a thing as a community in the first place. Mm. And that I think is one of the things that I felt very strongly throughout my life, that, that there really are wonderful things that we've inherited. All Americans, however, at whatever position in society they are, are still heirs to something rather remarkable. You know, a rule of law which is, goes on perpetuating itself from generation to generation. If, they, if only people knew how rare that was, they would see that they've got to fight to preserve it. You know, uh, uh, and the same with so many other institutions that we have yeah, inherited. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think one of the most, one of the most interesting things, and Gwyn, we were talking about Gwyn earlier, mm. the grammarian. Um, one of the things that Gwyn points out, and it really struck me in his little book on grammar that made quite a splash, I think, in the mm. UK. Um, one of the things that he points out is that language, our English language, has not changed a great deal. I mean, the conservation of the language this I, because there's a lot of people that the, the, the descriptivist will just say that language is whatever people use. Yeah. But there is a reason to hold on and to preserve language because if we allow language to dissipate into private uh, languages, we lose the ability to communicate yes. as, as a culture or a civilization. That, that is all true, uh, but also equally true is the fact that language as we inherit it is not the product of a single person. Or, uh, it's uh, ev the evolved gift of generations. And, and in, contained in every word, there is a, a, a kind of history of the human condition. We're actually inheriting wisdom with, with language. Uh, th these words make distinctions that we couldn't have ever made ourselves right. without their aid. And um, so, but we are living, entering a world where grammar is not given the importance that it, that, that it deserves. One of, one of the things, um, I, and, and, and talk, for me, I mean, conserving language is extremely important, and, and it was an obsession of uh, Muslims. Hmm. Um, the, the idea, the Quran, in essence, almost froze the Arabic language yeah. uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a period. So the, the ideal of Arabic will always be the Qur'an. And, and in some ways, the, uh, the King James Bible did that um, to English to a certain degree. Yes, it did. But interestingly, of course, the King James Bible is an unashamedly a translation. Uh, you know, and the Qur'an has, uh, is, well, I mean, most Muslims don't accept that it can be exactly translated right. uh, because it has, a, it, it has a perfection of its own. Right. Uh, uh, of course, it was recited... I mean, you know more about this than sure. me. It's recited long before it was written down, right. and and um, and then it had achieved a kind of uh, statuesque quality that um, that our Bible has never has never managed. But um, you know, grammar, the grammar of the King James Bible is often quite unorthodox, sure. and um, it, and it. Uh, it's a very strange book, and we now look, it is the book that made our 17th and 18th century literature. There's no well, doubt about that. Arguably, it's, it's the book also that made some of the greatest orators in, in, our, in, our, in our civilization. Yes. I mean, Lincoln, Lincoln's, Lincoln's reliance and dependence on, on the King James Bible yeah. was immense. And, but to, uh, um, hardly any church now uses it. Right. My church, the Anglican church, does use it. Mm. Um, but only in certain little places and in, in villages or in high ceremonial occasions. I mean, most of a, for the most part, it's the New English Bible right. that has replaced it. There, there, you went to grammar schools, and 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 they've been largely uh, the attack on grammar schools has been amazing because it's been seen as an elitist enterprise. Yeah. And one of the things that's that struck me, I, I read a book 
uh, by David Mulroy called mm. w The War Against Grammar. Yeah. It was quite an eye-opening book for me because one of the things that in teaching our students Arabic, it's very difficult because many of them have very little English grammar. Yeah. And, t and traditionally, grammar, uh, grammatical languages, I mean, all, all languages are grammatical, but by, by that I mean a language that is almost impossible to understand without knowledge of grammar, like Arabic, mm. um, because it's inflected and because it, it, uh, the verbs are conjugated. And so if you don't have some understanding of that, it becomes very difficult. But David Mulroy ma makes this argument that uh, in the 1960s, early 60s in the U.S., there was actually a movement to stop teaching grammar, and mm. they saw it as very abusive to That's children. Right. And, but, but what's interesting, he has, he has something that I've replicated in several classes. I, I, on average, I'll take 50 students. I give them the opening sentence to the Declaration of Independence, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, mm. to the end of that sentence. It's, it's, it's a sentence that has several subordinate clauses. And I, all I ask the students is, identify the main point of this sentence. Now these are college students. On average, out of 50 students, I'll get two or three that actually can identify the main clause. And, and so there's a type of higher illiteracy mm. that, that the fact that grammar has been removed. And I think a restoration of language is the only thing for me, the, the, the salvation of a civilization has to be predicated yeah. on the resurrection of, 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 of the corruption of its language. Well, that, I think you've actually touched on what the real essence of conservatism is there. You know, that, uh, that there are things that w the conservation of which is actually fundamental to understanding the world as it is. Right. And if you lose those things, like the rules of grammar, the habits of good speech, or good manners, uh, the sense of what a, a legal solution, as opposed to a, a mere bullying solution to a conflict might be, all those things we, we are, used to be taught to us as part of becoming an adult. If you lose those things, you're at sea in the world. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, uh, that most worries me about modern education. You refer to the, this movement in our schools to abolish grammar as elitist. It's absolutely true that grammar is elitist because it makes a distinction between the people who know it and the people who don't. Right. Uh, and that's the kind of distinction that we all need if we're to survive, right. not only as a civilization, but as individuals too. Right. So th this is where the real arguments for conservatism, in my view, should be based, not in the economic sphere at all, but right. in these uh, fundamental cultural inheritances. And, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, and I think it's very one of the things that really troubles me. We, we had recently a, a professor, I think, down in Southern California at a major university who was considered racist because he was uh, demanding that the students uh, use proper grammar. And so the minority students objected mm. to that because they felt that it was... Um, Discriminate. It was discriminatory, mm. and 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 one of the things about uh, in our culture, and I and I think the the poor white uh, people in this culture are also disenfranchised from a, a type of normative or conventional yeah. language, and I and I think it's very disempowering to do that. Um, yes, of course. Uh, um, w when uh, I was at school, uh, grammar school. Uh, I was. I came from a poor background, right. you know, and we yeah. were our teachers. As their their first instinct when they found that you were, uh, in some way, handicapped by your the the language that you'd learned from your parents, was to take you in hand, give you the advantage which your family had not, so that you could catch up with the others. Right. And I think that's that idea of teaching that you that you're actually lifting people up so as to be able to receive their yeah. inheritance. That idea has gone to a great extent. Yeah. Uh, it's much more now that the teacher comes down to the level of the student. Exactly. And this, is, and this uh, Pygmalion is a good example of that because mm. Shaw, in, in Shaw's Pygmalion, and, and it, obviously there's a lot of irony and sarcasm in that, but the idea of the flower girl who speaks yes. non-standard English, yes. wanting to speak like a lady, to yeah. speak proper, uh, as a way of upward mobility. Yes. And, and, and one of the things that uh, Toynbee points out is that a civilization on its way out inverts that. So mm. there's a vulgarization of the patrician class where they mm. begin to speak 
in um, profanities, in profanities yes. and, and become... Yeah, unfortunately that is so, yeah. But yeah, I think we mustn't be too pessimistic about everything. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, your yeah. role, you are someone who's found in Islam something which gives him the foundation that he needs right. in order to confront this um, gradual degeneration of things all around. Uh, and I respect that. You, you want, if one can find that foundation, yeah. one can then start building again uh, to, to recapture those things which are jeopardized by uh, the laxness of, our, uh, of modern society. And I think you've got to be optimistic about that. You've got to think that you can recapture these things. Otherwise, you know, what, what, what are you doing as a teacher? You know, that's... Yeah. It depends on what day it is. Oh, really? Okay, right. <laughs> so yeah, right. They, the, uh, the Arabs have a, a, a famous story about a king who had a positive day and a negative day. Mm, right. <laughs> so, yeah, Yom right. Bus, so, I mean, some days I, I look out there and it's so overwhelming that, yeah. that what's happened. Um, uh, I think it I is... Mean, a... I mean, we're old enough. You're a little ahead of me, but we're both old enough to know how different the world that we grew up in is today and yeah. it's, it's quite devastating in yeah. a lot of ways my mother who was 96 when she passed i said to her she she when she was born there was a ottoman caliph mm -hmm. in 1921 <laughs> right. and 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 i asked her and she was extremely liberal um and and i was raised with with a lot of liberal sensibilities um, my father was very conservative but um so i got both sides and it, mm. it was very interesting to see those those two views and and how powerful each one is in its own way yeah. but um when i asked her once just what what do you think is the worst thing about what's happened and she said manners yes just <laughs> the right, loss so of manners yeah. and and one of the there's a french i can't remember his name but there was a french ethicist who wrote a book on virtues uh about 15 years ago was uh, that um yeah, Comte. Uh, yeah, Comte. Uh, uh, yeah. Something. Comte. It was called the Book of Virtues. That's right. Yeah. And the first virtue he had in there was courtesy. Yes. And and one of the foundational virtues of the Islamic civilization is adab. Yeah. And and which means comportment. Uh, it means decorum. Mm -hmm. It means courtesy. But it, it also mean means literature. literature. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. the adib is mm. is is a the the adib is somebody who has absorbed yeah. the humanities yes uh, the, well the, the the habits of proper dialogue and yeah i mean that that's all that is very interesting I, of course you living here in berkeley you know you only have to look out of the window to see how far things can decline <laughs> you know I, I live look out of my window onto the english countryside right and mostly horses whose yeah. whose manners remain constant from generation to generation yeah. um but i y go ahead yeah yeah but uh you know berkeley is famous for for being the pioneer in degeneracy of whatever form um and maybe one should you know the very fact that you can plant your institution here, here. <laughs> and still get, uh, not only recruit people but also create this kind of right. uh, atmosphere of uh, of peace and uh, uh, and goodwill in the middle of all this mm -hmm. suggests that you know that that berkeley style degeneracy is perhaps not more than skin deep mm. in the end well can i say something in defense of berkeley yeah yeah of being here i found the 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 people here are they're very welcoming people in and and, mm. and there's there and this is where i th i really try to avoid and maybe it's my mother and my father's influence on me of just seeing both sides I really try to avoid Manichaean type yeah. of worldviews, and and I th I think you know that this Dionysian impulse that that's clearly there in us as a species, and mm. the Apollonian this idea of order as mm. opposed to this kind of chaotic, um, ex ecstatic type of being. And I think one of the things in our tradition, in the Islamic tradition, was very interesting to me is they have this concept of what they call the mushdub sadik who's the, 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 the goal in, a, in the spiritual tradition of Islam is to be inwardly in a state of ecstasy, mm. but outwardly in a state of sobriety. Mm. And so there's this, this very interesting Dionysian Apollonian balance that's, that's, that, yes. that's actually taking place. Yeah. And I think one of the things that happens in a culture that, that loses the ability to experience internal ecstasy,
mm. like to, to, you know. Where it is, I mean, comes from the soul. I mean, I'll give you an example. There, there's a, there's a, uh, a I, I recently, I've been reading a book called Videocracy, which is about viral um, videos mm. online. And, and there was a video that went viral by this guy named Bear Vasquez. And it, it was him seeing a double rainbow outside of his house. And he's just in a state of just awe. And then he starts crying. He breaks mm. down and just starts crying. And, and he's asking, what does this mean? And, and there's something very powerful about mm. that is such an appropriate response to a well, double yes. rainbow. And I think whatever happened, it resonated in a lot of people, mm. what he was seeing. And I think we, our culture no longer gives people vehicles for the experience of joy. Ah, now that's a really important point. Um, pleasure has driven out joy. Exactly. Um, yeah. Because no. joy is essentially something which comes from your deep social nature, from your need for others and your need to give to others. Yes. And I think that I've often, you know, the problem is we're agreeing about too much. But um, <laughs> I, I see this in uh, the change in patterns of dancing. The, the dancing that that I love, like Scottish country dancing right. and uh, uh, you know formation dancing. Yeah. So Even I had that, to do Greek dancing. As yeah, a well, child. exactly. Yeah. Well, that, they, they are um, full of joy because they are ways of relating to others, forgetting about your your appetites, just right. being with. Um, whereas modern, uh, uh, you know. Head bash, smashing it's solipsistic. It's, it's solipsistic you, and narcissistic, yeah. it, and a narcissism is joyless right. it, it, because it concentrates only on what can be received and not what can be given. Well, well the other thing what's fascinating too about about that because I thought about dipke with Lebanese dancing, Syrian yeah. dancing, which is very similar to Greek dancing. That's right. And yeah. one of the things about that type of dancing is that there's a formalism that's very rigid, but within that formalism, mm. once you master it you're allowed to improvise and do certain things. There's a freedom yes. that comes. And there was something that my father used to always say about the liberal arts is that the purpose was this immense discipline that set you free. Yeah. That, that through that structure and discipline, you actually become free. That's... And I think we, this conflation of freedom with licentiousness and freedom with do what thou wilt, yes. the, 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 the kind of the Thalema, you know, the Abbey of Thalema, this idea yeah. that... Um, that we can just simply do what we, we want. And that's how we're going to find happiness. Yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. Now, there, there's a false idea of freedom which took over the world in the 60s, in a way, um, with the baby boomers. We don't know quite why, but it, uh, this idea that freedom means the, the absence of control. Yeah. Rather well, Plato than, would say it was a change, uh, sorry, the absence yeah. of control rather than? Rather than an order in the soul. Right. You know, uh, my, my ideal of freedom is something like Bach's Art of Fugue, mm. in which every note is necessary, but every note is totally free. You know, that, right. that idea that there is a, a, an order which reveals itself through free gestures. Mm. Um, and that's really what you're saying about those old Mediterranean style of, styles of dancing. Yes. I think it's also, uh, rhetoric was like that. I mean, Shakespeare, um, Miriam Joseph wrote a dissertation, mm. Shakespeare in the Arts of Language, where she proved that he had mastered all of these rhetorical treatises of, of, his, uh, yeah. of his time and, and knew over 200 um, tropes and, and, yeah, and, and, and schemes. It's amazing. That, and, and often borrowing from the very texts that, right. he, that he had mastered. So the artifice, which used to be a kind of positive term in, 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 in the past, this idea of, mm. of, of craft, yeah. of real craftsmanship, and I think the two areas where we still see it in our culture to a certain degree, I mean, popular music is, is, um, is very troubling in, in a lot of ways, but I think you still see it in, in music and sports, athletics. Yeah. You, you know, see it in jazz improvisation, of yes, course. Yes, yes. Um, which which can't, doesn't make sense at all until you've mastered uh, the chord sequence. And, right. Uh, and can hear the hidden melody in the improvisation. Yes. So in, 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 in sports, people go to these uh, stadiums or they watch on television. What they're waiting for is that magical moment, you know, the triple play in baseball. Yeah. I don't know what they have the equivalent in cricket is. Uh, I think 
hitting something for six or something. I don't know. <laughs> right. But but there's a moment where and, and people look at each other as if they've just witnessed a miracle. Yes. Something. But that that can only happen because of an immense discipline Absolutely. that that, yeah. that that occurred and and and, and we've lost that. Uh, we've lost that in so many other areas of, of, of mm. being human. But again, we can get it back. Yeah. And we've got to be, we, we have got to be optimistic yeah. about this. Well, we, for, for us, for, uh, in our tradition, it's, it's considered an obligation to be hopeful. Yes. That, well, of course, likewise for Christians, faith, hope, and charity yeah, are the yes. three fundamental virtues. virtues yeah. uh, meaning by charity... Love, it's a certain kind of love, yeah. yes. But that's another problem. That idea of love has become so corrupted. Well, it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's the Greeks had that nice distinction. Yeah, between agape and eros right. and all the other sorts of love too. Arabs do that as well. Yeah. Arabs have 10 different types of love. Oh, right. The highest being khalla. Right. The, the lowest being ishq, which is the yeah, kind of, Well, desire. actually, it's yeah, mm. desire, mm. Yeah, eros. Yeah, but... Hib is still quite a good thing. It's a beautiful thing, yeah. Mm. And, it, and it's, it's related, it's cognate of another word, which is seed. Mm. That love is something that is nurtured and, and right. grows. Because right. yeah, hub is seed, yeah. and hub is love. Right. Yeah. There you are. You know, one of the things that, um, that, uh, that the, the traditional world... Um, C.S. Lewis talks about this, but one of the things that the traditional world really understood was the wheel of fortune, which mm. has really been removed from, from our culture. Um, this idea that, that there is this cycle. Yes. And, and you're talking about optimism. When you're down at six o'clock, which mm. in the wheel was traditionally the corresponding uh, emotion was, was despair. Yeah. Right? So w nine o'clock was hope. Right, twelve o'clock joy, yes. and then three o'clock was fear. Yeah. Um, but that you know, Boethius in that the Constellation of Philosophy, that second chapter where he talks about this, yes. you know, this this wheel of of fortune, and and our culture is, you know, it it doesn't allow for that that recognition. No, because it it, it doesn't. Uh it doesn't allow for the idea that ultimately we must be reconciled to things rather because there's always going to be it's always going to be someone else's fault right. if if you're in trouble and um it's always going to be the case that that someone's going to step in and give you what you need right um i mean what 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 brought my attention to that was that was uh, hub you know hub yes because the in 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 the uh, in the Islamic tradition, the way to get out of the wheel was to get into the hub. Oh, right, yeah. You know, to 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 mm. to, to get out of the. Yeah, so you're not spinning. You're anymore. not spinning anymore. Mm. That things around you can can happen. Yes, the still point of and the turning world, as T. S. Eliot says. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, you know, one of the things in in trying to revive a civilization, is, Islam. Uh, Toynbee talks about a civilization with its back up against the wall, mm. and and he he says that there's different uh, responses to that. One of them is uh, what he called the Herodian response, and and I I think you see that in in places like Malaysia and and other uh, Muslim cultures, where Morocco is a good example of that, of just recognizing we've lost sovereignty, we have to live in the world, and and let's do our best. Um, mm. But then he says there's the zealots who mm. refuse to accept. Uh, uh, it's kind of the Masada complex, where yeah. where where instead of trying to grapple with what's happening, they end up just uh, reacting against it and yes. and 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 fighting it even to the death. So it becomes yes. a kind of nihilistic uh, response to to a crisis of civilization. But then he talks about the Pharisees, the kind of Benedict option, yeah. which is to to try to preserve. Uh, getting back to co conservation, to try to preserve the best of a civilization. And I think what one of the things that I'm trying to do and that we're trying to do here at Zaytuna, we have a, an extraordinary civilizational tradition in, in both the West and in the Muslim world. And Muslims living in the West are very often unaware of yeah. how powerful Western civilization and the ideas that many of them, I mean, I, in a lot of ways, the modern world to me is a Christian heresy because many of these uh, extraordinary ideas, uh, the rights of man, yeah. um, the idea that everybody should be free, 
you know, the, the, these are byproducts of the Christian uh, way of uh, life. Yeah, yeah. And, mm. and, and Locke and Hume, all these people, they were informed by Christianity. So yeah. their ideas didn't simply come out of some kind of philosophical mm. vacuum, right. that these were people that were in societies that were deeply dyed mm. in the wool Christian societies. But, yeah, one of the questions that people, we in Europe in particular, have is what happened to Islamic civilization? I, I, right. in the Middle East, you know, mm -hmm. um, we, you know, those of us who study these things mm -hmm. do, do recognize that there was an incredible in inheritance of philosophy, law, um, literature, yeah. and then suddenly nothing. Yeah. Uh, and now you go to the Middle East era, of course you meet the educated people, they're very, very few and far between, yeah. and, the, uh, and nobody seems to be concerned to teach this. Mm -hmm. And when you get the radical movements like ISIS, mm -hmm. it's not the knowledge and beauty of Islam that appeals right. to them, right. but rather the, the ease with which it can justify their murderous rage. Sure. You, you know? right. And that's something which I feel not enough is said about this, and in particular, we, we need Muslims to speak out about this and say, look, you guys, um, Islam is not about justifying these primitive emotions of not belonging that sure. you have. It's about something else. It's about an inheritance. I, and I don't know whether you feel the same about that. Well, I mean, I would say, first of all, one, one of the things that stable Muslim societies, despite um, the... the, the uh, the political uh, problems, um, despotism is certainly a, a problem in many parts of the Muslim world. But stable Muslim societies, what, what struck me, and I, I lived in, in uh, several Muslim countries mm. for many years, I was over 10 years in the Muslim world, what struck me actually was just the incredible goodness of so many Muslims. Right. I mean, I really, I found uh, the generosity, the hospitality, the, the incredible a theocentric worldview yes. that informs them and the ability to withstand incredible suffering. Mm. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, when, I, when I was in West Africa, I, I was trained as a nurse, so when I, when, I, when I was in, and I lived in West Africa, when I was in West Africa, um, I went with a physician and we, we would see patients. And one of the things that was so amazing was people would tell their symptoms, but they would, they would always preface it by saying, I'm not complaining, mm. I'm just, you ask me what I'm feeling. So I just yeah. want, I want you to know I'm not complaining. Mm. And then they would just say, Alhamdulillah, you know, praise yeah. be to God. Mm. And it, because they really were afraid of complaining. Mm. Just the, the, the gratitude was so, so powerfully embedded in a lot of these traditional cultures. Um, I, I literally saw Moroccan men when I first went to Morocco in 1977, uh, on, on more than one occasion, if they saw bread, they would pick it up and put it on their forehead and then put it in a, in a high place. Mm. You know, and Ezra Pound has a wonderful statement. He says that, I, he said, I don't know what power exploded in the seventh century of Arabia that spread to the libraries of Cordoba, but mm. I got a glimpse of it in the way the Moor walked in 1913 in Tangier. Mm. And, and, and mm. to me, there's, I, I love, so much about the Muslim world and there's so many things that I see in the Muslim world mm. that that when I come back to the West I, I really g get a bit depressed. Yeah well you, you're talking about piety in its widest sense aren't exactly. you? Exactly. That, that sense yeah. that, uh, that your gestures, uh, your words, uh, your way of being towards others all fit into a, a a kind of a pattern, which is not just you, but also is informed by courtesy as well as yes. obedience. I mean, and I just saw so many examples of that. Yeah, um, I'll give I'll give you just one. I, I was we, we we were on a trip in the Sahara, and our and our car got stuck, and and we had to seek uh, refuge in in a in a Bedouin. There was some Bedouin staying there, and it was an incredibly windy night, mm. and. Um, 
they literally sacrificed a, a lamb for us. They cooked it. They fed us. And, and, and these were incredibly poor people. Mm. And, th and then we, we went to sleep, and, and because the, there was so much wind, the man was holding up the, the central pillar of the tent so that it didn't collapse. When we woke up about four hours later, he was still there holding it. Oh, and, yes. and, and I was with an Englishman who just said to me, did he stay up the whole night? And I said, yeah, he did. Mm. And, and I just saw so many examples of that. That, of course, that, that Bedouin... Uh, hospitality, uh, the, the sense that the stranger is more important than you, that is something which is not only Islam, it's part of the desert way of life, I, isn't no, it? No, I agree, and I think mm. many traditional, I would say, I would argue that if you go to Mexican villages, You'd you will find, find very similar, similar yeah. and it's something about traditional cultures right. that breeds that, but I think Islam definitely inculcates that in its followers mm. uh, when it's practiced properly. Now, as to your question, what happened? I think the same could be asked about the West because, yeah. I mean, if, if I look at what's happened to, to family, if I look at, at the, the fact that pornography is, is the main um, entertainment medium now in, yeah. in the West, I mean, it's quite incredible, the, the, the industry, of, uh, the, which you and I are very familiar yeah. with just from the, that what we happened to yeah. be part of at the Witherspoon. Yeah. But um, I think... Two things happened that, that are tragic in, in the Islamic tradition. One is uh, somebody like Al-Farabi, who was ignored, um, or, or Averroes is another example of that, that the, 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 the influence of a kind of Eastern despotism, which was actually very alien to the Arabs. The Arabs were hmm. far more democratic. So the Prophet ﷺ, I mean, there's a chapter in the Qur'an called Shura, chapter yeah, yeah, 42, yeah, yeah. which is mutual consultation. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And, and, and so the idea of having a, a type of parliamentary government uh, would have been very natural to the Arabs, because that's mm. the way they tended yeah. to, it was more like an Athenian democracy in a lot of ways. In fact, when I took my teacher, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, to the parliament in England, he was very struck by the House of Lords. He mm. really liked the idea of having uh, what in, in, in the Arabic tradition are called Ahl al wal aqad the people that can mm. un, un, unravel and, and put back together again. Mm -mm. And these are like notables in a culture that have a lot of life experience. And so they have a wisdom that they can help guide a society. He, he was very struck by that. Mm -hmm. But, but he, he uh, and this is something you bring up, I mean, he felt that a parliamentarian government w would be perfectly consonant with an Islamic yeah. uh, way of ruling, that there isn't really any fixed type of Islamic rule. And I think what happened in the Muslim world is despotism, a kind of, uh, of uh, an Eastern despotism, became a model. And, mm. and I think it really stifled a lot of the incredible uh, intellectual and spiritual growth that occurred in the early part of Islam. Well, it was also the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, wasn't it? The way well, I mean, that was a huge, yeah. Yeah, which led to the new kind of, <clears throat> kind of criminal apparatus that advanced through the Ba'ath Party and things like that right. to take o take over this ripe fruit. And uh, but yes, I mean, uh, uh, politically, obviously, things went terribly wrong. But uh, what has always concerned me is the cultural aspect. Where, where is that? You know, um, wh what has happened to the, the great universities, and where do we find uh, proper articulate discussions in literary form, mm. and, and all the things that actually uh, and the Islamic civilization really needs? Right. I mean, well, I it, well that's what we're trying to do here. Yes, of I course. Mean, we, 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 and, and I think there are people within the Muslim culture. I mean, I have uh, friends in, in Turkey that are trying to do the same thing. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and there, there are attempts. But again, if you, if you look at, at uh, the, 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 the Muslim world has been hard hit for several hundred years. I mean, there's been a, a, a continuum. There, there's an argument now among certain um, Orientalist uh, tradition about that there wasn't... Um, a kind of stagnation or ossification, which I think, to me, is absurd. Hmm. I mean, I can clearly see uh, hmm. that that um, the the incredible interest in science and technology in 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 early Islam was amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and and I mean, if there was a Nobel Prize a thousand years ago, it's been said, 
every name on the list would have been Muslim. Yeah. So, so that's something that I think we as a, as a, as a, as a, a religious um, tradition and a ummah that we have to think deeply yeah. about. And, right. and, and I think it's very important. I mean, we called our, our uh, journal Renovatio or Tajdeed in Arabic, which is to make new again, yeah. to renovate the idea. And this is, I think, a, a very conservative idea. The idea that the house is there mm. and instead of tearing it down and rebuilding a house, mm. if it's a beautiful house with, mm. with, with a solid foundation, yeah. we need to renovate it, to, yeah. to make it new again. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's the same task that we have in the West. But of course, uh, there is, we have the freedom to do it. That's the important thing that many people worry about, uh, about the Muslim world. Do people have the freedom to do what you want to do? Well, I think you're certainly doing your role in, in promoting uh, the idea of conserving the best of the past. Um, my last question to you, one of the things that troubles me most about um, uh, a lot of attacks on conservatism is the idea that the best of progressivism, like w the elimination of slavery, mm -hmm. the, 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 the idea of, of getting rid of racism as, you know, the, the, this, mm -hmm. this idea of somehow that there can be ethnic superiority of one people over another. I, I believe that there, there are civilizational aspects that are certainly, I think, I would much rather have freedom mm. than despotism. And this idea that we can relativize these type things is wrong. But the idea that w one group of people is better than an another group is a very odious idea, I think, to anybody that mm. has thought deeply about that problem. But this idea that conservatism is conserving the worst of the past as opposed to the best yeah. and, and is not also acknowledging the idea that there are things that have to change. Yeah. And then it becomes, what are the strategies to bring about that yes. change that, that, that are going to... Yeah, I, I would say, as I understand it, that of course human beings are imperfect. That's the whole reason why they need institutions in order to mediate between them uh, and overcome conflict without violence. You know, uh, um, but we have inherited those sort of institutions, institutions that enable us to rectify problems and make things better. We're never gonna make them perfect. But that's why we, what we should be conserving are those procedures, the things that, uh, that uh, enable us to relate to each other in a humane and civilized way. Right. Uh, and that's for, that for me is what it's all about. All right, well on that note, I, I wanna thank you just for coming out and gracing us with uh, your intelligence and 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 um you've been supporting our our work with the journal the renovatio i hope you're um some of the people that enjoy reading yours will also benefit from from our mm. journal i'm maybe, sure maybe, they will yeah maybe you could give a little plug yeah I, I will definitely yeah. i think zaituna is one of the uh points of hope in the world in which we live now well thank you all right well god bless you and and thank you yeah. and and you uh, too. Look forward to a continued discussion. Mm -hmm.